in. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Um, so quickly to introduce myself, um, I'm the secretary of the Oxford University Society in Sri Lanka. So this society is the um, collection of um, alumni in Sri Lanka representing the university. Um, so for a long time, I think, um, uh, during Hiran's time and prior, prior to that, also we focused a lot about developing our alumni community. And this initiative started in 2021 um, to help aspiring students to apply to the university and helping them make successful applications. Uh, so this is the fourth year that we're doing this. So we are very excited about today's session. Um, so there are three key takeaways. I think this is uh, just reiterating what was mentioned in last year's sessions as well. Three key initiatives, three key takeaways that we would like for everyone to take from this. One, how to make a, a successful application to the university. Two, um, suggestions for potential sources of funding that you may be able to access, perhaps. Um, and three, a little insight into life in Oxford. Uh, so quickly to set the agenda, um, I will, I'm delivering the welcome remarks, then we move into the most critical aspect of this session, which is um, information that regarding the undergraduate admission process to the university, presented to you by uh, James Brown, who's the um, head of international recruitment, undergraduate admissions and outreach, and then we move into a student panel discussion. And uh, finally, we have a QA and a in uh, breakout rooms. So that's the agenda. Um, through housekeeping rules, um, um, I'd like to remind everyone to please keep your microphones on mute uh, because we have a lot of participants on the call. And um, you can write in your questions to us using the chat box. Um, I think that's available, Viran, if I'm not mistaken, for everyone. Um, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions directly from the students um, who are currently at Oxford during the Q&A as well. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank James, uh, who has supported us continuously for, for this initiative. And uh, James, over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that welcome. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you for inviting me once again. It's always nice to uh, to, to speak with you all. Uh, so yes, my name is James. I'm the head of international um, uh, student recruitment in the undergraduate admissions and outreach office. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen with you all uh, just shortly. So hopefully Hopefully you can see all that. All right. So that, yes, is that, can you all see that? Yes, Fantastic. we can. Thanks. Lovely. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, let's get started. What I'm going to do today is we're going to focus um, on the applying side of things, um, but I will also just give you a sort of uh, a brief uh, introduction also uh, to, to, to Oxford as well. So as you may be aware, um, Oxford, um, has been consistently ranked uh, number one in the world um, for eight years uh, running, according to the Times Higher Education World Rankings, at least. Um, but the most important thing really is that it's been a, a leading centre of, of learning uh, and research um, with, that had a huge, huge impact um, around the world over centuries. Um, it's a place where people who share a passion for learning, a, a passion for their subjects come together uh, and really change the world um, at the heart of, of what we do at Oxford um, and all those uh, on the panel today will be able to, to speak to that. Um, we'll be able to speak to the idea of Oxford being a place where um, people come together to research and to study and to help solve real world issues. Um, research covers a huge amount of different areas uh, at Oxford and as an Oxford student, um, you'll be studying alongside those and, and, and learning from those who are having a huge impact uh, around the world today. We're at the forefront of things like quantum computers, uh, um, at the forefront of things of, you know, of global importance, climate change, energy, food, water, waste, uh, AI, obviously, we've been, uh, academics have been working on that for, for many years. So it's a huge, it's a sort of a, a, a global community of people who are working on some of the cutting edge issues that are facing us around the world, regardless of where we're from. It's also about studying what you love. It's about following your academic passions. Uh, it's a stimulating environment. It's a wonderful environment. It's it's demanding. Um, there's no denying that. And we'll we'll get to that side of things later throughout the this this whole session. 
Um, but the teaching research learning opportunities are are exceptional. Um, and the environment that you're working in truly, truly inspiring. What we're trying to um, inculcate and support really is the idea of developing your thinking of so you can think independently, deeply for yourself and, and then have the ability to articulate those ideas and thoughts clearly. And, you know, as some of the comments there from some of our former students, um, you know, sort of uh, suggest that the breadth of the things that you can study uh, is also something which is, is really second to none. The way we teach at Oxford, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And obviously we have fortunate enough to have current students here um, to, to go into a bit more detail about these sorts of things. But through tutorials, uh, it's a really key part of, of that learning experience at, at Oxford. Um, this is very small groups. Um, so maybe just two or three students per, tu per tutor. Um, we really get deeply into, into the heart of the, of the matter under discussion and debate. Uh, so incomparable teaching, really, as well as the practical side of things for the scientists amongst you. Um, fantastic facilities, um, practical opportunities for you to learn too. So we're mainly going to focus on applying, as I said. So we'll, we'll delve into that a bit now. Um, obviously, I do encourage you to just generally do your research into Oxford. Obviously, this is a fantastic opportunity for you to learn more uh, with all the panellists we have today. But it's very important that you also, as individuals, if you're serious about applying to Oxford, you really look into uh, into it yourselves as well. Um, the website that we, we have is incredibly comprehensive. It, it really is everything that you need there. Um, so I definitely encourage you to, to, to look at the full range of um, resources that we have there. So applying. It is a bit different applying to, to Oxford than it is to the majority of other UK institutions. Um, and to, so to make sure that we do consider students um, fairly um, and thoroughly, there are actually several stages of the application process. So you need to apply broadly a year in advance of um, when you intend to come and study with us. So for those who would like to, those of you who'd like to come and study with us <clears throat> from September or October next year, you will be applying more or less now, really. So the deadline for application is the 15th of October. We'll get onto that into the next slide. So, yes, yeah, so you're working essentially a year ahead. There's no separate Oxford application. It's all through the University and College Admission Service or UCAS, as it's known in the UK. Um, so very much the same system as all those other UK universities. And on the UCAS form, you will make up to five choices of universities uh, and they will all go into one place and then be disseminated to those five different universities. Just something to bear in mind is that Oxford has that earlier deadline typically than most other universities. The majority of other universities have a sort of mid-January deadline. At Oxford, that's actually when you'll hear from us whether you've been successful or not, because you'll have applied to us by October uh, the 15th. So let's have a look at that timeline. Let's go into a bit more detail about that. So the first thing, really, it's very important, is to choose your college. Now, sorry, that's not quite true. It's to choose your course. I take that back. That's the second stage. So choose your course. By far the most important thing. OK, so... Um, this is the thing that you'll be doing for three or four years, or if you're studying medicine, even longer than that. So truly important that you spend time researching your course and choosing wisely. Um, you don't really have the capability to change course once you're at Oxford. It's only very rare cases that we allow that. And frankly, if your application is any way sort of undecided about what you might want to be doing, you're very unlikely to receive an offer anyway in the first place. So the UK in general is quite specialised quite early at Oxford. That's definitely the case. So choosing your course is a really important part of the whole process and very much worth spending a good amount of time doing that. Oh, and I so you've underlined something that I've seen. That Excellent. Um, choosing a college. Let's move on to that. Choosing a, a college or making an open application. Now, a lot of students um, think that it's, absolutely necessary to choose a college it's not it's not you can make an open application and indeed it's really not important as to the outcome of your academic application 
which co which college you choose, whether you even choose a college, you can make let us make the decision for you um, by making an open application. And when you look at the data behind this, there's no advantage or disadvantage to doing either. And I must say, if you indicate a preference of a college, because that's all you're doing on the UKS form, just a preference, you might end up, if given an offer, in an altogether different college anyway. And I almost guarantee that you will love the college that you're in. I, I haven't met many students who don't. So um, the college side of things, don't let that be a stress factor. You don't have to know much about it um, in order to, to, to apply to Oxford. And we can do that work for you too. So third stage, make, writing your UCAS application. As I mentioned, this should be done by the 15th of October. And it's a standard sort of form. You can create a profile now in UCAS and familiarize yourself with that if you haven't already. Um, what that comprises of is a personal statement. Um, all of your qualifications that you have taken up to now or indeed are going to take, because most students are applying before they've completed their studies. Um, a reference from your teachers or indeed guidance counsellors um, in some cases. Um, and that's it really. And then that, that's what gets submitted to those five university choices that you made. Now, at Oxford, there are a couple of more st steps besides that. So for most courses that we offer, we offer over 50 courses. For most of them, there are admissions tests. And these um, take place uh, in October. So between mid and late October this year, these will be taking place. You must register for um, a place, uh, a testing centre, if you are required to take a test for your course, by the 4th of October. And my tip for those applying this year, for entry next year, try and get your test centre place booked as soon as you possibly can. You don't need a UCAS number to do that, you just need to get registered at that test center. And this year, um, Oxford are using Pearson VUE um, to administer the tests. And that should be the case for the coming years as well. So these are very important because the same test is taken by every single candidate in the world uh, on the same day. So this is something for our tutors, which is incredibly valuable because it allows us to compare students with one another. Um, and good performance in admissions test can, um, very likely lead to being then shortlisted for interviews. That's stage six. We'll get to that shortly. Number five, written work. Now, some of our courses, it's, I'd say it's, it's definitely the minority of courses, require written work to be submitted by the 10th of November. Uh, your college, who is administering your application, will contact you about that just to let you know how to do it and what you need to do there. So you don't need to worry too much again about that. And in the case of any students, any of you here who are interested in art, or fine arts, a portfolio is, is what would be submitted. As I say, this is the minority of courses, so literature-based courses often require written work, um, those, those types of uh, disciplines. Interviews, all online, all students who are shortlisted for interviews sit their interviews online, and these take place throughout December. And in some cases, you'll be interviewed more than once, up to three interviews, actually, depending on the course you've applied for, or indeed, if different colleges wish to interview you as well. Um, decisions early to mid-January, as I said, usually by the time that you're applying or your application goes to those other universities, actually. Um, uh, so you, you will know by early to mid-January whether you've been successful or not. And then results as the final stage after you receive your final grades. If you've received an, uh, a, a conditional offer from us, hopefully that you get the grades that you we have laid down as the condition and you meet those and all is well and you come to Oxford and we say hello to you and you embark on your Oxford experience. So that's the overview. I'm going to go now into each part in a bit more detail. Um, choosing a course. And again, I urge you to talk to um the and ask questions of uh current students here today um about this element too um, and all of these elements really because they are obviously experts in these areas so the most important decision you'll make i think when applying to oxford is selecting the course that you'll study it's very important that you really really enjoy that subject um when you're getting up out of bed on a cold and damp and dark february morning 
which it will be in February. It's you know not much light around there in the UK and the, those sorts of uh, that sort of time of the year. You want something to, to get up and have that feeling. Yes, this is something I really want to be doing. This is something that excites me. I really want to be getting into that tutorial, into that lecture and exploring this subject. I really want to get to the library so I can do my research and preparation for my tutorial this week. It's something which is really, really important. If you're in any way ambivalent about the subject that you're applying to study, it's really going to be very difficult, A, to get offer, to get an offer, but also really, if you were, your experience would not be a particularly good one if you are um, not wholly uh, committed and passionate about that subject. So do something, choose something that you think you will really love and, and enjoy. It's such an important thing. Getting an Oxford degree is a life changing kind of thing. And, you know, it really is. It opens up so many opportunities. So better to have studied something which you really feel passionate about. And likely, of course, is that your performance will be better as well on course performance. So Oxford has many courses for you to choose from. There are a few different tactics you can uh, do use, employ to, to choose courses. Uh, you can go for your favourite subject, something that you've really enjoyed studying at school. Uh, do bear in mind that the way it's studied and, and taught at Oxford may be very different to what you're used to at school. You can combine two or three even subjects uh, of things that you enjoy or something, uh, something that you really currently enjoy and then there's something new to go alongside that. We offer many, many uh, dual uh, sort of degrees, um, combination degrees, etc. Or you could try something new that you haven't studied at school, um, archaeology and anthropology, biochemistry, material science, human sciences. These are things which aren't often studied at school, um, but allow you to specialise in areas and, and try something uh, new and something maybe an aspect of something you've studied in a different discipline in greater detail. So those are just a a couple of tips really but give yourself the opportunity to explore the courses and this goes really for all the universities you're looking at don't just get sort of blinded by those headline courses those courses we all know about those courses that your parents probably want you to study you know do have a look at all the full range of courses um because it really is in your interest to be doing something that you that you love doing once you've identified um a course um what you should do is is make sure you are on target to meet the entrance requirements or have already met those entrance requirements. Some courses require specific uh, subjects to so make sure you have those, otherwise you won't be successful. And I've put the um, A-level, IB and AP general uh, sort of guidelines there. It does depend on the course. Some courses, say well, I'll just take A-levels as an example, require three A's, others are two A star than an A. Um, so those are the minimum entry requirements we have for those courses. We do accept many different qualifications from around the world. So um, you can look at our international uh, qualifications page. You can see the link in the top right hand corner of the of the slide there. And um, but it is very important that I emphasize to you that um, you must meet those at least meet those entrant entry requirements. If you are lower, if you are be um, if you don't meet those, you won't be given an offer. OK, so it is really important that you do that. All right. English language requirements. Ultimately, you will be expected to meet these as well. Um, so make sure that you have an IELTS, TOEFL or, or frankly, many of the other. We accept many, many others, PS and, and, and all sorts of different English language requirements. Uh, sorry, uh, qualifications. Um, the good news is you don't need this at the point of application. Uh, you can apply now without having any evidence of your English language uh, abilities. But as long as you give that to us prior to coming to study with us, you will need that for your student visa, then that's absolutely fine. OK, um, as I say, if you look at that link, um, you'll see all the different English language qualifications that we accept. All right, UCAS form. Let's have a look at that. So there are several parts to complete. Um, and the most involved, I would suggest, is your personal statement. So this is where you tell us and the other four universities you're applying to study, um, your motivation for studying that course. Now, students typically choose courses at the different universities that are very similar to one another. You, you shouldn't be applying for, I don't know, archaeology and anthropology at Oxford and then applying for accounting at LSE. That's not going to work. So you must choose things that are very similar, okay? Because you're not going to be able to write one personal statement 
that is going to be convincing to any of those audiences. Um, and that's something which obviously you, you have to demonstrate to all the universities that you're serious about studying this subject. Obviously, we know that some courses at Oxford and the same for other universities will differ in name and in composition. And there are some courses at Oxford that literally can't be found anywhere else as well. So we are kind of obviously forgiving about that. So that's you don't need to worry too much about that. But obviously, we can't have students applying for for medicine here and uh, Oxford and then, then, you know, fine art and like UCL or something. So it, it's just not going to work. So plan your statement. Um, some universities place a huge emphasis on this statement. Uh, whereas at Oxford, I have to say, it is just one component part. We we saw the overview there, didn't we, of, of, of the different elements of the application process at Oxford. We have a lot of different data points to look at. So the statement is not going to be as important, frankly, at Oxford as it is at other universities. However, um, obviously, you are going to be applying. If you are thinking of Oxford, you would be applying before other universities anyway. So you must take time to do this. And of course, you know, if it's a shoddy statement, that's not going to reflect well on you with us either. So check your grammar, check your spelling. Talk to us about your academic motivations primarily. Um, at least 80% of it should be about your academic with an academic focus. This is where you tell us why you want to study the course, how it links to your current studies, um, any outside exploration um, of that subject, which we call supercurricular activity, such as things that you've watched, things you've listened to, visited, read, reading is a you know, big part of, of studying Oxford, of course. So um, essentially, if we love a subject, we read about it. I studied history many, many years, many years ago. And, you know, I, I read, I, you know, I'm reading history books all the time. I mean, that, that, that was before I applied to university and that has been subsequent. So if you have an interest in something, you read about it, don't you? You consume it. And this is what we want to hear about in that statement, really. Um, that and your just academic pursuits. Anything beyond that, the extracurricular activities, the sports, the debating, um, the volunteering is frankly of much less importance to us. And that's generally the case, I, I think, in the UK. If you're also applying to the States, they love all that kind of stuff. They want to hear about all that kind of stuff. We don't really, to be honest with you, we want to hear about your academic interests and pursuits. Um, so just bear that in mind, um, because the last thing you want to do is submit an application with a statement that talks about all your extracurricular activities. The tutors are never going to talk to you about that. They're never interested in it. So but supercurricular academic engagement beyond your school studies. Yeah, that's that is important. OK, um, don't be tempted to employ people to help you with this. It should be all your own work. Don't waste your money on doing that. Um, so it's really, you know, a good way also of discerning yourself and deciding, is this subject for me? Because if you can't write convincingly about this, it's probably not for you. You should be able to write thousands of words about this. Unfortunately, you only have 500 words or so on this statement. Um, so, yeah, it's something which uh, is uh, a good starting point. Now, what are Oxford tutors looking for? They're interested in your academic ability, but also your potential. That's a really big thing. Uh, they want to see that you're committed to the subject. They want to see passion for your subject. Um, and they'll try and look at your statement to understand what's motivated you to apply for the course. As I say, it is just about one feature of your application to Oxford. The admissions tests are a very important part for those courses that require them. So, um, as I mentioned, everybody sits the same test wherever they are in the world. So it's a really useful piece of information for our tutors to be able to see how students are performed relative to one another. And they help us choose between what are excellent candidates. So we have many, many excellent candidates applying to us every year. And so it's very hard for our tutors to make decisions about um, these, these excellent candidates. So a strong te test performance can really help support your application and successful application. So the most important thing you can do right now is figure out, do I need to take a test? Okay, so that's step one, identify which test you need to take, find that test center locally, book your place as soon as you can uh, by the deadline, but you know, the sooner the better, okay? 
Now, what you can also then go on to do is prepare for your test. Once you've got that all sorted, prepare for your admissions test by um, doing the practices. The practice, uh, we have lots of practice materials on our website, on our test pages, all the links you can see there on the top right again. Um, successful performance in admissions tests um, is down to preparation, actually. Um, familiarizing yourself with the form of the test. So knowing what to expect in relation to how it's organized, what's expected of you in that test, and doing some practice in advance of taking it. It's it's definitely in your interest to do so. And we have a lot of materials on the website to support you with that. Okay, and just to emphasize, if you don't take your test um, and you have no significant extenuating circumstances for not taking that test, then your application will be significantly affected, i.e. you most likely won't be shortlisted for an for interview. So if there is some reason as to why you can't take the test, it has to be a, a, a very a serious sort of uh, situation. And that has to also be um, imparted to us, usually with evidence to, to back up this, this, this claim. Uh, but otherwise, you must make every effort to take that test. Okay, interviews. Uh, so there are quite a lot of myths about interviews at Oxford. Um, however, uh, what I would characterise them as being are short are discussions about your subject, your favourite subject, which it should be, and really they're mock tutorials. So we're seeing how you perform in a tutorial-like setting. And you're also seeing what's going to be expected of you if you come to Oxford and, and how that will work on a weekly basis. So you're usually interviewed by two tutors, all online, as I mentioned. So, you know, again, worth familiarising yourself and practising talking out loud online about your subject in advance of, of, of applying to Oxford. And what we're what the tutors are looking for is your academic ability and potential, your motivation, but really... Also, your ability to think independently, your ability to think out loud. So letting them know what you're thinking, your engagement with new ideas. OK, um, we don't expect you to know the answers very often. To be honest with you, you won't know the answer. That's quite common. So don't freak out. Don't worry if you don't know the answer. Um, you're not expected to. If you knew all the answers already, our tutors would have nothing to do if you came to Oxford, would they? They literally wouldn't. They don't want you to be the finished article. They want to actually improve you they want to work with you to to fulfill the potential that you have so don't worry if you're in an interview and you you literally don't know the answer what they want to hear from you is how you might go about it what are your thought processes think out loud and you, you're essentially you're essentially exploring these themes together very often there is no one right answer anyway to a lot of the questions that they will posit so it's about ex exploration, academic exploration. And I think that might also help you a little bit in terms of nerves, thinking, OK, I'm not expected to know every single answer to every single thing at this stage. And you're not. You're really not. But what they want to see, of course, is your ability to think creatively, to think independently, to be able to engage with new ideas and apply existing logic to new ideas as well. So. I think these interviews are something you can really practice for. And I think, again, it's very important that you do this because it's not like a job interview. And I know many of you would not necessarily have had a job interview by now anyway, but um, they're not a formal set of, of, of questions and answers that you sort of must uh, sort of get right. It's, it's actually an academic discussion, uh, which very much sort of creates a, a sense of what a tutorial will be. So we're looking to see how well you do in that. And of course, for you, it's very useful too, because you can see what's expected of you. So practice and engage also with all the proprietary materials that we have. So in our team, um, in the international team, which I, uh, which I manage at Oxford, we run lots of webinars, lots of events over the coming months about preparing for admissions tests, about preparing for interviews. So come along to those. Um, obviously work hard. I mean, that's given. I'm sure you're all working hard. Um, go beyond your schoolwork, stretch your minds in terms of your extracurricular um, activities. 
we have lots of resources that you can engage with on our website and practice, you know, practicing for those tests and interviews. And please don't wait until you're told that you're going to be interviewed to practice because you're often told about a week before you're interviewed. So that's not really enough time. So you should be practicing now if you're thinking of applying this year. And attend our webinars. We have many webinars um, which we send out the information to schools. So if your school is not telling you about this, then tell your counsellors or your teachers to get on that mailing list or get in touch with us or get in touch with us through the fantastic alumni group here. Always very happy to get you on board with our webinars um, and also lots of web links there for you where you can go into more detail all about the things that we've discussed today. Uh, as well as chat to our international students and test resources and many other things. I will leave it there um, and pass uh, back over to, um, well, I don't know, am I passing to Ren or Sanjay? I'm not quite sure. Anyway, thank you very much. And we'll go into Q and A's later. Thank you, James. Really fantastic presentation as always. I always find this incredibly helpful. It's one thing to read about all of this on the website, but you know, when you've got uh, somebody explaining this to you, it's um, it's so much uh, clearer. And then I think hopefully by the end of this session, um, uh, people have a much better idea of uh, how to go about this process. So uh, I think at this point, um, I'd like to invite our panelists uh, to maybe join the discussion. We have four panelists today uh, who have kindly agreed to uh, participate. Um, this is normally the most interesting part of the discussion because you get to hear from uh, people like yourselves that have already been through this process um, in terms of uh, you know thinking about applying, uh, not imagining that they could actually ever get in, um, somebody or you know somehow be nudged towards an application and then the elation of actually getting the yes, uh, and then the experience of actually being a student. So. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, let the panelists actually introduce themselves because I think we'll, uh, we'll split this uh, panel into four parts. The first part is really a slightly more detailed introduction from each of the panelists where you can start to understand where they come from or where they're coming from, you know, where they went to school, what uh, they studied perhaps, uh, and what they're doing right now as well uh, at Oxford. So uh, that you can maybe start to see yourself in their shoes. Uh, the second part then would be about the actual application itself. Like how did you prepare to make your application, what research you did, uh, et cetera. Maybe if somebody you know, helped you and guided you a little bit uh, in improving your application. So you know, how did you actually make the application? Uh, the third part maybe on the uh, exam or the assessment rather and the interview. Um, you know, how was that? And then finally, you know, life at Oxford, funding sources, other interesting things. And of course, if we don't get to all of the questions, we'll have uh, breakout rooms at the end where each of the panelists will be available to answer any questions that we don't get to. Um, so with that, uh, why don't I uh, hand over to our first panelist, Navik, uh, if you'd like to maybe start us off and just tell us a little bit about where you studied, uh, what you studied, and uh, what you're doing right now at Oxford. So a uh, quick introduction, please. Yeah, hi guys, good evening. So I studied uh, in Moy back in Sri Lanka, and then I started engineering at University College in Oxford in back in 2002. So now I'm in my third year. And yeah. Um, so for I a fun did. fact about yourself, sorry, now like maybe something interesting that you'd like to share with the group about yourself. <laughs> Can't really think of anything in the moment. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you on that one then. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, just one more logistics point. If uh, the audience, you've got any questions for the panelists whilst we're going to, please post it in the chat and uh, we'll try and get to those as well. Um, Sani, would you like to uh, do a quick introduction? Yeah, hi, I'm Sahani. I went to school at Ladies College in Colombo. Um, I'm currently studying medicine at Balliol College, and that's since 2021. Um, yeah. Okay. And... Can't think of a fun fact either. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to have to come back to you as well. <laughs> All right, Srini, don't let me down. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, my name is Srini. 
I went to school at the Mary Erskine School in Edinburgh in Scotland, um, but I did primary school in Sri Lanka and moved over. Um, so, yeah. Um, and uh, I'm in my final year of studying law at Magdalen College, Oxford. I matriculated, so started uni in 2022 as well. Um, and a fun fact, uh, my favourite fruit is the rambutan. Um, nice. Just missed the seasons, really. I know. Uh, I miss them here. You don't get them here very much. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Nishain. Hey, everyone. Um, so I went to St. Joseph's um, in Sri Lanka, uh, did up to O-levels and then came here for A-levels. And then I mat matriculated, so got into Oxford in 2020 to Brazenose College, which I would say is the best college in Oxford, and then uh, to do engineering science. And it's a four-year course, so I've already graduated. So I'm a recent graduate of Oxford. And fun fact about myself is if you come, you know, if you come to my room in Oxford or where I live, I'll always serve you tea. And you'll always have to drink at least four cups of four different types of tea. And how much sugar is in those teas, Nishan? Well, I, I don't have sh much sugar, but if my guest wants sugar, I'll, I'll add as many uh, teaspoons as you like. Thank you for that. Amazing. Now, Vixani, any fun facts to share or shall I? I'm guessing that's, that looks like a no, maybe. Okay, look, um, the... Um, I, I should have mentioned as well, maybe uh, mentioning your A-level subjects, but that's okay. We can, you know, perhaps get to that. I want people to sort of understand, you know, what sort of things you were studying as you kind of thought about applying. Um, James mentioned earlier about maybe the non-traditional subjects as, as well. Unfortunately, I randomly selected this panel and I then realized I had two engineers, one lawyer and one doctor. So we're not, <laughs> we're not moving too far away from uh, the traditional uh, but again, if uh, at the end of the session you want to find out about maybe some of the alternative subjects and you want to speak to students with that background, we'll have um, members of the Oxford uh, Alumni uh, Society in one of the breakout rooms as well, and you can come in there and ask uh, us some questions and we can try and help get you connected. Um, I'd like to move to uh, the, the next step of, set of questions, which is really about thinking about applying. You're all here today because you've thought about uh, perhaps applying. And you know, I saw the quote in James's presentation, which is like, I never thought I could apply. And most people start out that way. Nobody ever, or very few people would start out thinking I can apply. And I'd love to ask each of the panelists to talk about their journey from, I never thought I could apply to actually saying, okay, I'm gonna make an application. And how did you go about that process of making an application? Um, so maybe Srini, if I can go to you first this time, um, how did you get from, I never thought I could apply to applying? Um, so I think, um, you know, the, I, I'd been to Oxford as a tourist before, but I hadn't really considered the possibility of being a student here. Um, and around the age of 15, 16, we had a careers meeting where my careers guidance person you know, mentioned you have the grades, maybe we can think about Oxbridge, so Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and I I had it at the back of my mind, but I didn't really think, you know, that there's one thing, getting grades at O level. So uh, we did Nat fives, but O level level. But another thing is going to Oxford or going to the high up university. Uh, but I went to a couple of online webinars like this. Uh, I did the online open day in 2020. Um, and then I watched some YouTube channels about people who did um, law at Oxford, current students just watched how they were. And I realized, you know, they're just people like me and you, and it's a possible thing to do. So uh, I tried my best in 2021 with the application and got lucky. Nice, um, interesting. Uh, others uh, that, you know, maybe didn't have the opportunity to visit Oxford uh, in the panel, Anyone who didn't actually visit Oxford before you applied? Everyone managed to get that. Navik, go ahead. Yep. No? I know which Oxford before. Okay. So what, yeah. what was your kind of, I think I can apply or I should apply? I wasn't even thinking about going to Oxford. But then after my results came, my counselor was like, 
I get anyways feel for universities in your UK as well. So instead of like picking some universities I'm never gonna attend, just change to Oxford, like because you have a chance of getting in. Yeah, just based on his word, I just thought of applying to Oxford. But and now in then, your process of making an application, um, you know, what was most helpful to you in that process? Uh, my school, for sure. They did almost everything so you, for me. You were fortunate to be at a school where they really helped you with the application, I guess. Yeah, and like from making the decision to my personal statement, they did trial interviews with me and yeah, they did. They helped me throughout the whole process. Interesting. Um, anyone on the panel that maybe didn't get as much help from the school uh, and, you know, just really talked about watching YouTube videos, et cetera, as well, to try and gather information. Um, and it, Sahani Nishan, did you guys get a lot of help from your school in applying? Um, I did get uh, a lot of help from my UK school. Um, so I guess I did get a lot of help and there was a lot of career support and they sent us to different summer schools and stuff. So that was quite helpful. Um, but it's not necessary that you actually go to those summer schools either. Um, but it just helps, you know, like get a feel of what living in Oxford is like. And there's like many like free summer schools that Oxford has, like, I think St. John's does inspire. Um, there's something called Unique. So if you guys can get into one of those, it's 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 quite nice as well. So, yeah. Got it. Sani, did Ladies College give you a lot of help as you were applying? Um, so... I think my experience is a bit different because I did the local A-levels. Yep. So our section was quite separate from that. So that wasn't really something we thought about until we had left school. Um, and we were kind of in that gap between like study leave, sitting A-levels. And then that was also the time that applications were supposed to go in. So uh, we had a really helpful career guidance counselor in the London section who did my like recommendation letter and like he helped me make the UCAS account but I mean in terms of the like admissions tests and stuff they weren't really familiar with the timeline or like how to prepare for it and it was the same with the interview so I really relied a lot on my friends they were like watching YouTube videos for me and did mock interviews um, and then also just the Oxford website was super clear so I kind of knew what had what I had to do in terms of like the deadlines and things. And then, yeah, just like uh, Srini mentioned the YouTube videos for sure. There were a lot of um, YouTubers at Oxford who had made videos about like what to expect from admissions tests because that was something completely foreign to me. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of information in a lot of places. So it was kind of challenging to uh, kind of sit it out into a timeline. But um, yeah, I had the backing of school as well. They were really good. It was kind of fun. Got it. Um, there was a question from the audience as well around this, but in making a successful application, James talked about being able to really demonstrate through your personal statement, your passion for the subject that you are studying. Um, there was a specific question around internships and whether you need to do internships relevant to your area of study before you make an application. I uh, would love to get your comments on that, uh, but also, uh, you know, in general, you know, how you perhaps demonstrated passion for your subject in your personal statement. Um, anyone that wants to take that, you can just... Yep, go Um, I think this is something I hear a lot, um, especially from people who are applying, but I've been speaking to this year as well, especially with subjects like law or medicine where there is an end career goal that most people go towards. I think what I'd say is when you're writing your personal statement, um, you're demonstrating that you would be a compelling student to study that subject rather than a professional doing that job. So the emphasis isn't necessarily on doing things like internships, but rather doing things that evidence, um, you know, an enjoyment of academic research. So I, my, in my personal statement, I didn't have any real internships. I had one legal volunteering thing at uh, an organization called Citizens Advice Bureau in the UK mentioned, 
but most of my personal statement was about books that I'd read, lectures I'd attended, because there are, there's a lot of lectures, which especially the uh, law faculty do online on YouTube. Um, there's the Bonavero Institute for Human Rights that has something like 150 online lectures on their channel. Um, so it was lectures, it was books, a couple journal articles, online courses from uh, providers like FutureLearn or Coursera, things like that that you can do to evidence the fact that you are interested in the academic study of a given subject rather than being a professional. Um, so I think don't worry about internships. Got it. Very helpful. Um, are there any other comments on that? And maybe how you demonstrated your personal, on your personal statement, your interest on the subject area? Sani? Oh, sorry, Nishan, go ahead. Um, I thought um, intern, I didn't do any internships for when I was in school or during this sort of period. I think what for me that I put in my personal statement was the books I read and sort of the projects I did. When you do engineering, if you've you know, done a coding project or if you've done a sort of a science project and you can really highlight your expertise in the engineering design process, the, you know, the scientific methodology and stuff. I think that that's very important as well. I mean, work experience helps, I guess, to demonstrate, you know, your understanding in engineering. But I think if you can show your sort of interest, like self-driven interest, um, and the ability to actually choose a project that you want, I think that shows more initiative as well uh, compared to getting, you know, set targets and stuff. Being able to actually self-drive some initiative is quite good, I feel like, for the personal statement. Got it. Excellent. Um, maybe then moving on a little bit from making an application to the assessment and the interviews, um, any sort of advice that you have to students, maybe take the admissions, uh, the assessment first and then the interview second, but for the assessment, um, any preparation that you did uh, for the assessment that was useful uh, that you would want to relate to others? Asani, would you, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I think, so at the time when I applied, Oxford had a different admission. So there were two admissions sites for medicine and Oxford was taking one of them, the DMAT. Um, but now I think they've also moved to the UCAT. Um, so I can talk about the UCAT generally. I would say like with the UCAT, it was kind of a question of like getting used to doing that style of exam. Like it's completely different to any kind of exam you've written before because there's so much time pressure and also just the way um, the different sections are made like um, just as important as getting the right answer is also knowing when you're not going to get the right answer in time and when you need to just skip and move on so I would say for me the most important thing when preparing for that was just practice there were a lot of um, practice tests online for free um, as well and then I know there are banks that you can subscribe to uh, which have like pretty much like unlimited questions and then there's also a bunch of YouTube videos that kind of explain different techniques. I mean, not all of them will work, but some of them, not all of them will work for you because they're kind of made by individual people. But I think by joining the tool of like advice from people who've done the exam before and then also just continuously practicing doing that style of exam, you kind of come up with the technique that works for you. Um, so yeah. It's and, just getting um, used Sunny, to that. Where kind did of you exam. do your test here? Like, was it at school or was there a, a testing center? Or where did you do it? Um, so I did mine during COVID. So we were allowed to do ours at home. Okay. Um, the BMAT we did at the British Council, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm not sure if they moved the UK also to a center now. Got it. Okay. I know, you know, James is trying to expand the number of schools that understand what uh, they're doing and, um, uh, take advantage of the resources that they provide and also um, give, um, you know, have the qualification to become testing centers as well. So any of the students who are on the call today that want uh, us to maybe help connect uh, their school administration 
with uh, the university to try and do some of that, uh, you know, maybe again, come to a breakout at the end. Sorry, James, go ahead. Sorry, can I just, yeah, go in. So it has changed actually since last year, um, Hiran. So um, all tests are taken in test centers as opposed to in schools. So okay. yes, it's- uh, Exactly, all, um, and do we have a lot of accredited test centers in uh, Sri Lanka at the moment, James? Um, not a lot no it's okay. fair to say um i'll um it de it depends slightly on which test people are going to take but it's all about going through the the portal which is on our website on the test pages of the website and it's very easy to find where test centers are for that particular test um but um if if any students are having any issues with that it's very important to to, to raise that with firstly pearson and, and ourselves and we can resolve that so but it's not through the school that's just something really to um to flag up right on. thanks and sorry james i saw you come on when we were talking about the internships was there something else you wanted to add to that or just echoing what no no just to reiterate what said absolutely nothing nothing to add all all the advice oh, right. <laughs> exactly. okay. just nodding along really <laughs> brilliant um sorry so maybe navik or i think you probably took this test you know most recently do you want to maybe just talk about your prep for the test and how you went about it yeah so for engineering i do the pat test and for that i basically studied the same things i studied for the air level physics and maths test like the test didn't have anything different other than the content for that so the test was pretty easy. It was like right after my A levels, so like all the physics and stuff was still like fresh in my mind. But yeah, yeah I had, had the test it, in school. Is what you're saying? Yeah, it was like literally like a month or two after my A levels, so it was like okay. the same content as the A levels. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, and the test was at school as well. Interesting. Great. Um, and thanks, James. There's a link on the chat, which everyone should be able to see that has the uh, test information. Um, great. So then moving on uh, to the third part, which is, uh, oh, sorry, interviews um, for that. Um, can I ask for, uh, you know, James said, start preparing now for the interview in anticipation of getting it, which is a great positive, self-fulfilling way of uh, approaching this. Uh, but any uh, preparation tips for the interview? Srini, would you like to start on that? Um, I think, uh, like uh, Sahani said as well, get your friends and your family and teachers, if you can, um, to do mocks with you. They don't have to be full mocks, even short ones. Um, the skill you want to develop is thinking through your thoughts step by step um, and presenting a structured argument. Um, I'd recommend the star structure, so situation uh, techniques of what you did and, and a bit of analysis and reasoning. If you just Google star structure, it comes up, um, which is good for just all types of interviews, but I think especially good if you're answering a question, like a competency type question, like, oh, why do you want to do the subject? Um, answering in a structured way, if you're answering any questions, so in law interviews, um, you tend to get two different types of questions. So you get scenario-based questions where they give you a situation and a law. So my interviews, I had three of them. Um, the first two were about the Dangerous Dogs Act. So I was shown a piece of legislation, a law, um, and then given a situation about uh, either stealing dogs or dogs that were biting people or were dogs you that familiar were with away. this legislation no I've never yeah. seen it before in my life yeah. okay. um so what they did in the first interview is they gave me five minutes with the legis with the statute on screen and they let me just read through it um if you get that i'd recommend having a piece of paper and a pen on hand to just note things down um that helped me and then we talked through different scenarios so it, it, whenever you're giving an answer uh, again, use structure. So say this is, uh, say yes or no, because usually the questions are, would the law apply? Would it not? So give your answer and then say yes or no for this many reasons and then list your reasons. Um, and for one interview, I was given an hour to do pre-reading. And again, I'd say take notes, don't panic. Um, 
you won't be expected to know how to read a case or how to read a statute or anything. It takes you half of the law degree to figure that out. Um, so don't panic, just take notes, do your best. And if possible, um, there's a database called Bailey. So B-A-I-L-I, -I, I think, or double L-I, that has uh, a lot of free online UK legal cases, which you can access from anywhere in the world. So I'd say have a look through just a case or two, or even the Supreme Court judgments, which are also online and available. So you have, so you're familiar with how legal text looks and how it sounds. So it's not too jarring. Um, and yeah, practice, practice, practice. That's the most you can do. Oh, that's amazing. Um, anything from the engineers and the medics? How did the interview go for you? And what was the question that you got asked? Um, yeah. Um, so for the engineering interviews, it's quite different from the law interviews. They they focus more on your technical knowledge in engineering. So you'll be solving a lot of mathematical questions and problems. Um, so the interviews can be scary sometimes for some people, but I think what's important is the tutors are trying to look at what you're thinking and your thinking process in maths. So the things I'm, I think that's most important in engineering is to show each and every step or at least iterate each and every step um, to the tutors so that they actually know how you got to the answer. And there's a lot of sort of websites like physics and maths tutor, Oxford interview questions or something. I, I can't remember all, all of them now, but if you search them up, they'll come up. There's like past interview questions that people have submitted and you can sort of read through them as well. And there's uh, Thomas Povey, Professor Thomas Povey's um, 101 perplexing engineering problems as well. Whoa, sorry, um, what was the question you got, Nishan, in the interview? Um, so I think one problem is a bit similar to uh, Thomas Povey's book because I was interviewed by him. Uh, <laughs> okay, so was, research uh, his, his questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, one was, it was two uh, cylinders and there was a box on top of it. So I was asked to find the acceleration of the two cylinders and the box. Uh, so I need to consider things like friction, um, you know, weight and stuff like that and come up with an answer. So you, was that something you did easily or was that something you needed guidance to figure out? I think that was one of the hardest questions in the interview because they just give this image and you have to structure everything yourself. So you need to understand that this is where the weights go. This is where the center of gravity is. You know, you have to add friction. So as you build it, build on, um, sort of they'll guide you through the process as well. So I got stuck in one place where I couldn't really find the acceleration uh, because I didn't see some geometric um, principle. So uh, Professor Poi was fine with it. He was like, you know, even an undergraduate first year wouldn't get it. So it was good that you came this far. So they're not really looking for perfection or, you know, you'd be like a super genius or something. Yeah. They just need you to sort of go through the process and understand it in the interview. Yeah, so this is very interesting. I have to say, uh, so mm -hmm. I did my interview in 1995, I think it was, and I had yeah. exactly the same experience. It was literally a question that you didn't know the answer to, but they sort of yeah. guide you through a little bit. And if you can work your way to the answer, mm -hmm. you know, that's what they're looking for. And if you get stuck somewhere along the way as well, it's absolutely fine. It's just yeah. the way you think. And it's so interesting that in whatever 20 odd years, it, it literally has not changed. So exactly. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, Sani, uh, I would like to ask you the same question, but also there's this, you know, now it's all done online. Or a lot of these interviews are done online. Um, does that change? Did you do your interview online and does that change the dynamic of this uh, interview? Um, so I did mine online as well. I think it might have been the first year because of COVID. Um, and I haven't experienced it any other way, but when I went for one of my first tutorials, like our tutor showed us the couch where they used to sit students down and you'd just be facing them and they'll be bombarding you with questions. So honestly, I think having it online made it less daunting. Like, 
obviously it's easier logistically as well as you know if you're applying from abroad but um also I think personally for me I felt less afraid having the separation of a screen um and you know like I had my paper next to me and I didn't it was less awkward to be like trying to figure stuff out on a piece of paper and I think that you just do a good job of making you more relaxed and the fact that it's on a couch is that I think it's supposed to make it more informal um but yeah I personally I think preferred having it online I what 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 is is there a guideline of what you wear to one of these interviews uh they there were some recommendations but I don't think it's very strict like I know some of my friends just wore t-shirts uh for yeah. their interviews <laughs> I, I see James shaking his head and saying, "Now nah, you can you can wear whatever you want, t-shirt, suit and tie, yeah. whatever you want. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Uh, great. Listen, let's move on to then the last bit, um, which is, you know, really uh, uh, a couple of different things. There's a question always that comes up around funding. I think people are always keen to find out. Unfortunately, this is one of the areas of least joy, um, particularly for students coming out of Sri Lanka, because there aren't that many sources of funding, but just to keep in touch with anything that might have changed, any tips, any words of advice around sources of funding that uh, students might be able to explore? Okay. <laughs> um, maybe, I don't know what the circumstances of students are, I mean, on the call, but maybe some have for, like, um, uh, plans to go to the UK and uh, you know stay there for a few years but applying as a home student Srini uh, was there any sources of funding that uh, you may be able to uh, sort of apply for? Uh, yeah um, depending so there's um, if you're a home student there is the student loans um, there's the Scottish one and the English one um, and if you are means assessed for um, a higher loan payment or a loan a bursary from that organization, you also get um, avail access to a crank start scholarship at Oxford. So I, I don't know, I, I think maybe that might be available for international students. I'm not sure. Um, but that's uh, sort of like a payment to help with student costs and living costs while you're at Oxford. And I think in terms of funding and living costs, uh, that's where um, obviously every college um, has some sort of funding provision, but there's some colleges with greater funding provisions than others. So I personally know Maudlin, we have a student support fund, uh, which is very good where if you um, ever need support with uh, accommodation or living costs, or even if, you know, a week before the exam, your laptop breaks down, they'll, they'll help you cover any emergency costs or even reoccurring costs. Um, so I think look at the funding available from individual colleges, if that's um, something that's important to you. Um, and yeah, if you're eligible for it, once your uh, income, like your household income is assessed, you'll also get the central crank start fund, which is available at every college at Oxford. Got it. Amazing. So yeah, so I think there's there's certainly uh, loans that people can take out. There's um, you know scholarships. Unfortunately, not too many available for Sri Lanka students. But then college level, there are bursaries, etc. I see James has posted another link. I think everything is literally on their website, so all of these questions can be researched. Uh, thanks, James, for that. Um, but yeah, so Sorry, can I just uh, add something? Please about add, that. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's sort of an annual thing, but. Um, there are like private scholarships. So I remember in my year, HSBC was offering a partial scholarship. HSBC Sri Lanka was offering a partial scholarship as well to students hoping to study abroad. So um, those might also be something to look at, like outside the university. As interesting. Well. That's helpful. And I see that James has put here that a Sri Lankan students are eligible to uh, apply for the REACH scholarship as well. So that's very interesting. Um, so thank you for that. Um, great. Look, I think the last question before we wrap up uh, is really about colleges. I don't want to go too deep into colleges because uh, it's something very specific to Oxford and Cambridge, and um, I think students will probably know a little bit about it. Uh, but if, uh, you know, just to maybe talk about it, if you have a strong view 
on making an open application versus choosing a college. I know there's no correct advice. James talked about this as well. I think you can be successful both ways. But if you want to talk about what worked for you in this uh, in this step of the process, because you choose your course first, but then after that you choose your uh, college, uh, any advice that you have on, on colleges? Nishan, you said you love Braze Nose and it's the best college, so maybe you can go first. Yeah, I <laughs> mean... I went to Braze Nose as well for everybody here. Yeah, uh, I mean... I mean... I think applying to a college is, I think it's a special thing. I think you should think a little bit about it, like spend at least one hour, you know, researching about colleges and sort of, I guess there's a lot of like virtual tours these days online as well, because of COVID, everyone sort of photographed their college extensively. They did extensive room tours. So I would recommend like people who are thinking of applying to Oxford to at least, you know, look up, you know, go to YouTube, just spend a few hours watching them and see if you really vibe with that college because all the different colleges have their own different vibes. It's very hard to explain, but I think you, you'll understand it when you sort of visit the place or look, you know, look it up on YouTube and just see which one you vibe best with and apply there as well. And another thing is, as um, I think Sahani said, like funding and sort of some sort of bursary opportunities are different at different colleges. So if you apply to certain colleges, they have things like vacation residency. For example, Mansfield is very nice about giving accommodation for the whole of the year, whereas certain other colleges would sort of kick you out uh, during the holidays. So think about sort of those subtle things when you sort of apply. I think that's quite important. At least that's what I think. And I think Brazenose was quite nice to me. They let me stay on during the vacations uh, if if I needed needed to stay and didn't want to go to Sri Lanka and stuff like that. So um, that's, yeah, something to think about. Amazing. Anyone else who wants to chime in on that? Yep, Srini. Um, I just wanted to add, as well as just like living um considerations like staying over the back and funding um another thing to look for is with teaching so um obviously you're doing the same exam whichever college you're at but the college system determines what your tutorials are going to be like and i think if if you're applying if you're set on applying for a specific subject try to pick a college that has a fair few professors that or fellows um, that teach that subject and specifically teach the modules that are sort of the core modules for your course. So at Maudlin, we tend to have, or and historically have always had uh, law teachers that cover the main modules for the law undergraduate degree, which really makes a difference um, when you're doing the tutorial system. And, you know, we have specialist like uh, mock trial um, coaching sessions as well. Um, which some other colleges don't have. So look for look for the professors and also look if you're um, doing, you know, some of the more traditional subjects like the people on the panel for things like medicine and law, especially. Some colleges have uh, student societies that bring in speakers, organize competitions, they have dinners, lots of career opportunities. So I think um, if you're picking a college for a subject like that, uh, look for the societies and look for the professors uh, just yeah for educational and act and career opportunities right i think there's a comment from james saying may not apply to some of the subjects as well but certainly for law uh, i think that that holds true um you mind mind if I, we're almost out of time if, Sorry, mind if I just, if come yeah. in on that one Hiran. um i think it's great to, to hear uh you guys talk about colleges but i just from a from my perspective and, and I guess the perspective of my colleagues, I think it's something which can overcomplicate the application process or potentially in the minds of, of applicants when it shouldn't necessarily do so. Um, I think as long as your college action <laughs> covers the course that you're applying to, obviously that's something we haven't mentioned. Not all colleges teach all courses, uh, so do check that. But it's it's the minority of students who put a preference of a college that actually end up in that college anyway. 
also. So I think um, it's something just to just to bear in mind. Um, practical considerations such as the summer back, I think, are really important for, for international students of leaving your belongings there and not worrying about that as well. And, and whether the, the duration of the time you can stay in your college for accommodation is possibly um, rather than getting into the, the nitty gritty of who teaches what, where. Um, but that's just my opinion. It's all about opinion. So, um, yeah. Amazing. Thanks, James. Um... Great. Look, I think uh, we really want to leave some time for the breakouts and for people to kind of ask individual questions. Um, I am going to hand over to Rishan for a quick word of thanks and then uh, the final logistics of the, the breakout room. Great. Thank uh, you very much. I, yeah, on behalf of the Oxford University Society of Sri Lanka, I would like to thank all of our participants for today's session. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the Head of International Recruitment, Undergraduate Admissions and Outreach, uh, James Brown. James has kindly been participating in these sessions since we started them during COVID in 2021. And we really appreciate having his direct insights, which as Hiran mentioned, always makes the application process relatable. So thank you, James. I'd also like to thank the current undergraduate students at Oxford. Um, Nishan, Srini, Sahani, and Navik for joining us today and sharing their undergraduate perspectives and insights uh, to the application process. Um, hearing also Sahani talk about uh, listening to YouTubers and all it just makes it uh, a bit more uh, relatable for this current generation, which are things that we didn't really get to do when we were applying to Oxford. Um, so thank you for sharing your insights, all of you. Um, I'd also like to thank the um, my fellow uh, committee members from the alumni network here in Sri Lanka, uh, Hiran Embaldenia, who started these sessions during his term as president, and uh, Sanjaya Arewansa, who is our current secretary. With that, uh, we'd like to thank you all also, the, part of the attendees, for joining this session. We will try to have this session with our other materials available and accessible online. I think we also have some of our previous sessions uh, on the YouTube channel for our society. So check those out. For those interested in a graduate application process, we also have those previous sessions online and we hope to have a live session later this year around middle of October. Uh, we'll now break out into the rooms where we hope you'll be able to ask questions directly from all of the participants. Uh, we'll close the session after about 45 minutes, or if there are no more questions. Uh, we wish you all the very best in your application process, and please remember that even if you don't get into the University of Oxford this time, there are many other good universities and opportunities out there, so keep that in mind. So a bit of logistics on the breakout rooms. I think uh, there'll be a few, there'll be breakout rooms assigned for each of the different uh, participants so you can choose which one you want to join and please do ask questions thank you sorry so e james uh and each of the panelists will be in a separate room the oxford alumni reps will be in one room they're each labeled so you can choose which uh, breakout room you want to go into uh, the panelists and the james will automatically be assigned so you don't need to uh, do anything uh, and when you do get into those rooms if you want to ask a question i'd encourage you to actually switch on your camera and your microphone and uh, put your hand up uh, so that whoever is in that room can call on you to ask the question. Thanks everyone. Thanks.